Friends, you will know that the Methodist Conference has been taking place in the uh, past few days. I was uh, attending online along with uh, the few who could meet physically in Birmingham. Um, there was about 300 of us all, all together. We took a number of decisions at the, the conference and the president and vice president have uh, <clears throat> written to us and asked that the letter be read out and shared with all congregations this Sunday. So I'm going to um, read that letter now from the uh, <clears throat> president, Reverend Sonia Hicks, and the vice president, Mrs. Barbara Easton. Dear friends, we wish to take this opportunity to write to you after the conference voted on the resolutions contained in the Marriage and Relationships Report. We very much appreciate that these decisions will stir up many different emotions for our siblings across the connection. There will be some who will be deeply hurt and others who will rejoice by what has been decided. Our presidential theme this year is God's Table, an invitation for all. And God's invitation is for every single one of us. The Methodist Church has held tension for many years and as a church and a family, we must do all we can to live with contradictory convictions. This work was first reflected on back in 1992 and we have been on this journey together since that point. During the past years, we have continued to listen to and, pray and to pray for each other and remaining true to what God is saying to us. We must remember in all this to continue to hold each other in prayer and to support each other as we find a way forward respecting our differences. It is perhaps helpful to remember that there are other issues, some of them discussed at the conference, on which we hold differing and sometimes strong opinions. We live with them and we do not allow them to impair our communion with each other. We respect each other's consciences. We exercise judgment in when to speak and when to be silent, and we hold one another in prayer. We do all this, not for our own sake, but for the sake of Christ, and for the sake of the world, which urgently needs to know the power of Christ's reconciling love. Our prayer for you, beloved siblings, is that in joy or sorrow, in pain or excitement, we might continue to live within that reconciling love. Sonia Hicks and Barbara Easton. Bless you, folks. Welcome, and thank you for joining us at the Angus, Dundee and Perthshire Methodist Church Circuit. I'm Julia Walsh, and I'm leading our worship today. Our prayers are by Beryl Cowling, and our readings by Sheila Lamont. As the talented composer and hymn writer Marty Haugen says in his well-known hymn, all are welcome in this place. No matter where we are, we are all together in a place where the love of Christ ends divisions, a place where we claim the faith of Jesus, a place where we come to worship. And so we come humbly into the presence of God, whose power is made perfect in weakness. We know that without God, we are nothing. Come together, be bound together, in the company of our strong and loving God, and worship him. Amen.
We come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and ever-loving God, we come into your presence again this morning, longing to hear your word to us, as we know you as the God who speaks to the created world, as you have always done, through the prophets of old, through your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, Word of God incarnate, and by your Spirit, speaking into our hearts today, as we wait upon you, let us not fail to hear your word to us. Forgiving God, as we come before you, we are conscious of our failings since last we worshipped together, our failures in love, our failures in kindness, our failure to put you at the centre of our lives or to take that position for ourselves. Our failure to listen for your voice, preferring those voices which call us away from you and away from each other. We ask you to forgive us, gracious God, as we ask in the name of your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Enable us to hear in our hearts those precious words, you are forgiven, go in peace, and we are thankful. Accept our thanksgiving, gracious God, for we offer it in that same name, Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all praise and glory, now and forever. Amen. We say together the prayer which Jesus gave to his disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The readings today are taken from the Good News Bible. The Old Testament lesson is taken from Ezekiel chapter 2, reading verses 1 to 5, the vision of the scroll. He said, mortal man, stand up. I want to talk to you. While the voice was speaking, God's spirit entered me and raised me to my feet. And I heard the voice continue. Mortal man, I am sending you to the people of Israel. They have rebelled and turned against me and are still rebels, just as their ancestors were. They are stubborn and do not respect me. So I am sending you to tell them what I, the Sovereign Lord, am saying to them. Whether those rebels listen to you or not, 
they will know that a prophet has been among them. The Gospel reading is taken from Mark chapter 6, reading verses 1 to 13. Jesus left that place and went back to his hometown, followed by his disciples. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many people were there, and when they heard him, they were all amazed. Where did he get all this? they asked. What wisdom is this that has been given him? How does he perform miracles? Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters living here? And so they rejected him. Jesus said to them, Prophets are respected everywhere except in their own hometown and by their relatives and their family. He was not able to perform any miracles there, except that he placed his hands on a few sick people and healed them. He was greatly surprised because the people did not have faith. Then Jesus went to the villages around there teaching the people. He called the twelve disciples together and sent them out two by two. He gave them authority over the over evil spirits and ordered them, don't take anything with you on the trip except a walking stick, no bread, no beggar's bag, no money in your pockets. Wear sandals, but don't carry an extra shirt. He also told them, wherever you are welcomed, stay in the same house until you leave that place. If you come to a town where people do not welcome you, or will not listen to you, leave it and shake the dust off your feet. That will be a warning to them. So they went out and preached that people should turn away from their sins. They drove out many demons and rubbed olive oil on many sick people and healed them. The final reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, reading verses 2 to 10. I know a certain Christian man who 14 years ago was snatched up to the highest heaven. I do not know whether this actually happened or whether he had a vision. Only God knows. I repeat, I know that this man was snatched to paradise. Again, I do not know whether this actually happened or whether it was a vision. Only God knows. And there he heard things which cannot be put into words, things that human lips may not speak. So I will boast about this man, but I will not boast about myself, except the things that show how weak I am. If I wanted to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be telling the truth. But I will not boast, because I do not want any of you to have a higher opinion of me than you have as a result of what you have seen me do and heard me say but to keep me from being puffed up with pride because of the many wonderful things I saw, I was given a painful physical ailment, which acts as Satan's messenger to beat me and keep me from being proud. Three times I prayed to the Lord about this and asked him to take it away. But his answer was, my grace is all you need, for my power is greatest when you are weak. I am most happy then to be proud of my weaknesses in order to feel the protection of Christ, Christ's power over me. I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions and difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen. And thanks be to God for these readings of his holy word. So, three readings with one thing in common. They're about rejection and failure. From Ezekiel, we heard words about him being sent to people who were stubborn and rebellious and about his being rejected by them, something he was warned about from the start. He was set up to fail before he even got a foot out the door. I don't think I'd have accepted the job, to be honest. And from Mark's gospel, the story of Jesus preaching in Nazareth and the people being offended by him and rejecting him too. But that didn't stop him sending out the disciples with a warning that they too would be rejected. 
And finally, from Paul's second letter, written to the Corinthians in about 55 AD, he speaks of being rejected by people because of the lies of his enemies, who unjustly accuse him of boastfulness, emotional instability, and being ineffective in the way he looked and spoke. Now, I don't know about you, but these readings don't do anything to fill me with confidence or my heart with joy about sharing the good news of Jesus. If these had been the first passages I had heard when I considered becoming a Christian and giving my life to God, I may well have turned tail and run away. But God is good. And that didn't happen. Sing of the Lord's goodness, Father of all wisdom, come to him and bless his name. Mercy he has shown us, his love is forever faithful to the end of days. Come then, all you nations, sing of the Lord's goodness, melodies of praise and thanks to God. Bring down the Lord's glory, praise him with your music, worship him and bless his name. Power he has Our prayers for others and ourselves. Using some of the words of hymn 718 from Singing the Faith by Anna Briggs. Lord, we lay our broken world in sorrow at your feet, a world ravaged by the COVID pandemic, where the less affluent nations are made to wait for the vaccine until the richer nations such as ours, have satisfied their requirements. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring our broken towns, our neighbours hurt and bruised, not just from the pandemic, but by greed and neglect, 
the neglect that caused the collapse of a high-rise housing block in Miami, the disgraceful treatment of asylum seekers here at home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring our broken loves, families brought to their knees by lockdown and still suffering the consequences of relationships destroyed by stress. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the church throughout the world, for the Methodist Church here in Britain, as our new president, Reverend Sonia M. Hicks, and Vice President Barbara Easton assume office, and for individual churches throughout the connection, we ask your strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring our broken selves, confused and closed and tired and grieving, that we may feel the breath of your spirit, breathing new life and love and hope and trust into us, that we may each be lifted up to you and feel again the warmth of your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers and bless us and all for whom we have prayed. In Jesus' name, Amen. told in the Ezekiel reading that people can hear or refuse to hear, something we all probably do at times in our lives. 
It's something my husband is very good at, especially when I'm calling him to do something he doesn't want to do. But then I'm certain there have been times when I have also refused to hear or simply not paid attention or not listened at the right time. We heard in the reading from Mark that the people of Nazareth so nearly heard, so nearly believed and received Jesus' message. They already knew all about the deeds of power he'd done elsewhere. So they should have believed him, but instead they took offence at him. If you read Luke's chapter 4 account of the same event, the people got so angry they tried to hang Jesus and throw him over a cliff. I seriously hope that I never get a reaction like that when I'm leading worship. But it seems that the thing that really stopped the people of Nazareth from hearing and receiving the message of Jesus was that one of them was getting above himself. One of the young men suddenly seemed to think he was better than them. Familiarity, perhaps. Isn't this the carpenter? Don't we know his family? Haven't we watched him grow up from a scruffy kid playing in the street with his friends? Who does he think he is preaching to us? We have more qualified people in the synagogue to do that for us. He's just the same as any one of us, no better. I believe that they were very unhappy with Jesus because deep down they knew what he said was right. It's a very human thing to react in this way if we think someone's getting above themselves, especially when in our heart of hearts we have a suspicion that this is a message we really should be listening to. Another reason to reject a message might be because the person who brings it is strange. That could mean strange because they're unknown or foreign or culturally very different to us, or it could mean just strange. For example, the prophet Ezekiel was seriously strange. He's known for his abnormal personality, his obscure imagery, his otherworldly visions, and for saying and doing some weird things, including going into trances for days. So it's easy to dismiss him and what he's saying just another crackpot. But as with Jesus at Nazareth, it's clear that there must have been something about him and what he said that made people know, if they were honest, that there had been a prophet among them. And that's the issue, isn't it? To receive the messages which God is giving us, we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be open to God's word in whatever way it comes to us, because it may well be that the messages from our loving God, which are going to affect our lives most deeply over the next few weeks or even the next few years, aren't necessarily going to come on a Sunday from the pulpit, from someone with a white collar or with qualifications and authority to preach in the church. So we have to put aside the excuses or the prejudices which might make us refuse to hear. We have to carefully take notice of those uncomfortable feelings that tell us we are wrong not to listen. And of course we need to test the message and look to see how it fits within the whole context of scripture and the church's collected experience. But we must not block God's voice out because of pride or irritation or fear or because of whoever's been sent to us with the message. And it's because everyone reacts in the same way as we do. We must understand the fact that being rejected, turned away, not listened to or even laughed at has to be an expected part of our calling. But it's how we deal with that that counts. I think sometimes we expect God to make things easy and offer us wonderful opportunities to tell people about Jesus Christ. 
with them all listening intently and instantly accepting him into their hearts and lives. I wish. Anyway, when that doesn't happen, we get disheartened. But it's clear from these readings that our job is not to judge whether we're being effective evangelists by counting heads and weekly offerings to see if they're increasing. But our job, our only job, our path, our mission, or whatever name you want to give it, is about answering God's call and being obedient to him. It's about sharing his word and moving on without regrets if we're not listened to, just as Jesus ordered the disciples to do, no matter how difficult or frustrating that can be at times. We just cannot take it personally. So how do we move on without regrets and without being totally disheartened? Well, Paul tells us how. He talks about what he called a thorn in his flesh, which prevented him from making the impression that he wanted to make. Although he's not very imposing, he understands and is content that he's doing the very best he can for God and that God lovingly supports him in his weakness. We're told he prayed three times for his affliction to be removed, but each time God told him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Strength in weakness. What a strange idea. I think it's something that we find very difficult to get our heads around, especially in a world where vulnerability and lack of material resources are seen as a weakness. But Paul's radical message is quite clear. He insists that the power of Christ becomes known through weakness. That point where we're down on our knees, at the point of despair and of giving up. Paul learned that his strength was in his weakness and that our loving God valued him and used him that way. God said to him, my grace is enough. And so it was for Paul, despite his affliction and the problems he encountered from hostile preachers and his work being rejected and destroyed. Paul was made effective by God in his weakness just as one other famous man we know was. John Newton, famous hymn writer. In, in 1794, John was press ganged onto a warship, was beaten and starved, narrowly escaped drowning, death from enemy fire, desperate slaves, mutinous crews, tropical diseases and violent storms, and was eventually transferred to what was everyone's nightmare, a slave trader's ship, although he went on to be a slave ship captain himself. But it was when he was at his lowest point during a wild storm at sea, on his knees, desperate, expecting nothing but death, God spoke to him. And in his weakness, Newton listened. And because of this unexpected encounter with God, he turned his life around. He was ordained and later became the minister of the most influential church in London, writing hymns in praise of God. His most famous hymn, of course, being Amazing Grace. God says to us too, go to the world and do my work. And when we feel that it's too much for us, when we are weak and on our knees, feeling ineffectual, I'm ready to give up. He says to us too, my grace is enough and he will use us in our weakness. All we have to do is have the faith to believe it, just as Paul and John Newton did.
Paul said, that is why I am content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecutions and calamities for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wonderful, strong and mighty God, as the ones you send, we go into the world in our weakness to share your power with those around us. Bless us in your service, Lord, today and every day as we struggle to live your word. Amen.